Good morning, everyone. I'm Lori Gagne, retired director of the Edmund Dyke Center for Peace and Justice at St. Michael's College in Burlington, Vermont. And I have the great honor of speaking today with Mazen Kumsia, who is a Palestinian scientist, author, and activist. Mazen is the founder of the Palestine Museum of Natural History and the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability at Bethlehem University, where he teaches. Our conversation today will cover a range of topics from Mazen's personal story to conditions in Palestine today, to his vision for the future, to the work that he does at the Institute, and probably most importantly, what we as Americans can do to support the Palestinians in their struggle for liberation. Now, before we begin, I have to say that I am really thrilled to be taking part in this conversation with Mazen today. This is the second time that we have met. The first time was in the West Bank in 2018 when I was part of the Meta Peace Team. A group of us had a day off and so we went to Bethlehem University and knocked on his door and he was most gracious and gave us an impromptu lecture which we all later agreed was the most uplifting thing that we had heard when we were in the West Bank. So I'm really happy to be instrumental in getting his message out to a wider group. So Mazen, let's begin with your personal journey. I would say that you've had a really interesting life trajectory. You were born in the West Bank, you moved to the United States where you had a distinguished career as a geneticist and evolutionary biologist, teaching at places like Duke and Yale. But then in 2008, you came back to Palestine. Could you, and you've been there ever since, can you tell us about the turning points in your journey? Like why you left in the first place and then what precipitated your return? Uh, thank you very much, Laurie, for uh, hosting me, and uh, I look forward to a good discussion, and uh, uh, really it's an honor for me. Um, I have, uh, I was born in a small village called Beit Sahur. It's a shepherd's field where the shepherds uh, basically heard the angels sing, told them, prompted them to go to Bethlehem where Jesus was born. And my family is a family descendant from those people who lived here 2000 years ago when this monumental event uh, supposedly took place nearby. Uh, uh, the history of my childhood and my growing in Palestine under Israeli occupation, of course, which we can come to later, uh, but it prompts, like everything else, when you have injustice, uh, Blacks in North America, for example, uh, growing in the era uh, of the 1940s and 50s and the lynching and all of this stuff, uh, many of them turn to activism, and I turn to activism also. And activism was for us also uh, in a colonial situation, of course, uh, being present on our land is a form of resistance. Getting education is a form of resistance. So we are all considered resistors. Uh, when the colonialists uh, wanted to change this country from a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious society to make it the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, anyway, as raised here, of course, I started aspiring and many Palestinians got education under these circumstances. They turned to education because uh, it's a form of empowerment. So I went and got my higher degrees, uh, bachelor in Jordan, master and PhD in the US. And then, as you mentioned, I went into other areas. I did postdocs in genetics and medical genetics, and then I worked at the University of Tennessee, Duke, and Yale. Uh, but while working in those uh, uh, prestigious institutions, I was also engaged in political activism, human rights work on many areas, not just Palestine, including even on South Africa, uh, 
uh, etc., apartheid systems, and so on. Um, and then I decided in 2007 to start moving back to the West Bank, and I did move back here in 2008 to Palestine. Uh, why did I move back? Well, uh, it's because I felt I would be needed more here than in the U.S. The U.S. has, you know, I was active in the U.S., as I mentioned, on human rights issues. But, um, but I felt that I could use my time better here. And the U.S. has been moving in the right direction, in my opinion, uh, since I first went there in 1979. Uh, the U.S. has changed. And there's more activism of groups like the one you have in Vermont and other groups that are doing more activism for human rights, for justice. So I felt I fulfilled my role in the US and time for me to go back home uh, and, and stay with my elderly mother and <laughs> all yeah. of this stuff, you know? Uh, and it was the best decision I made in my, in my life. Economically, it was terrible, of course because I lost a six-figure income, went down to a, a three-figure income or sometimes zero-figure income. Uh, but uh, it was a very good decision in my life. Uh, so, uh, so that's why I moved back. Okay. Well, having left and come back, you have a kind of unique perspective on the situation in Palestine. Can you talk about the change in living conditions under the occupation, particularly in the West Bank, but in all of Palestine um, in the last 50 years or so, like maybe you could compare what it was like on your return in 2008 with what it was like for you as a boy growing up and then what it's like now compared to what it was like 14 years ago when you returned. Yeah, when I was uh, raised as a child under Israeli occupation, I remember even Israeli soldiers beating my father for no reason that's whatsoever, only because he refused to obey their orders to clean the street, so to speak. He was a teacher and his dignity was, I didn't make the street uh, dirty with these stones or whatever, why should I clean them? And uh, they beat him up for uh, challenging them, basically. And uh, from then on, these childhood memories uh, to the uh, uh, events in the past uh, 13 years that I've been back here, uh, things do change, of course, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the worse. But colonization is, seems to be the constant still here. We're not free yet. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, in brief, I don't want to make this a history lesson, but in brief, we have uh, 14 million Palestinians, about 8 million of us are refugees or displaced people, that's two thirds or so, um, living in refugee camps inside Palestine or living outside of Palestine like Jordan, which has about 4 million Palestinians or Lebanon or Syria or Egypt, or even the United States, which has 300,000 Palestinian refugees. Um, the refugees are dispersed around the world. Uh, Palestinians are refugees not by accident or anything else. Uh, it happened by a meticulous process of ethnic cleansing that we, in our uh, language, we call Nakba, catastrophe which has been going on for the past 73 years since the founding of the State of Israel. And the reason for this Nakba, for this catastrophe for our people is that Israel uh, as a state was founded based on a vision. The vision of Zionism was a Jewish state in Palestine. You know, when, uh, when the Zionism came about in the 19th century, uh, and then led by a guy by the name of Theodor Herzl out of Vienna, uh, Theodor Herzl sent two rabbis to Palestine to see what it's like and whether it's suitable for a Jewish state. The two rabbis, uh, before they sent their full report to Herzl, uh, but after they visited the country, they sent a telegram to Herzl. The telegram simply said, 
the bride is beautiful, but she is married to another man. In other words, the country is beautiful to become a Jewish state, but there are people here. What are we going to do with these people? And Herzl and all subsequent uh, Zionist leaders had to contend with the fact that this country was not empty, a land without a people for a people without a land, as I repeated, but was heavily in, uh, you know, inhabited by its indigenous people. And that to make it a Jewish state and bring Jews and converts to Judaism from around the world and make a Jewish state of Israel, ethnic cleansing had to be done. And this process didn't stop in 1948 when Israel was created as a state. Um, it actually accelerated uh, after that and continues to this day. And uh, we, that's why we have this refugee population. This is the crux of the problem. Uh, this is the etiology of the problem, as we say in the medical field. Uh, the diagnosis is basically settler colonialism. And this diagnosis has many symptoms, which we see. And in the last 13 years, for example, we see things like home demolitions, uh, uh, killing of Palestinian children, thousands of Palestinian children were killed just in the past 10 years, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, building walls, building colonies on stolen Palestinian land. Uh, all of these things happen regularly and we see it and it has not changed since 1948. Uh, so that's what we observe in the period that we, that I witnessed in my life. And I, since I came back personally, I lost uh, 21 friends of mine who were killed uh, by the Israelis. Um, not one of them was armed, uh, you know, or resisted, uh, whatever, uh, in armed resistance. They were either participating in demonstrations or at the wrong place at the wrong time. Their homes were demolished on top of their heads or things like that. So uh, this is my own personal experience, and I can tell hours and hours about this, but Right. you get the picture. Right. So it's your understanding that that Israel hasn't gotten necessarily more brutal and more aggressive in the last 50 years or so, but is just continuing this yes. very aggressive kind of colonialism that it, it's had since the beginning of the country or since Palestinians began to be displaced. OK, so well, let's um, talk about your vision of the future. Uh, in one of your books, uh, Popular Resistance in Palestine, um, you say that we have to give up um, the old roadmap for the future, uh, the old roadmap for peace, which is the two state solution, and take up a new roadmap, which is combining human rights with a struggle against apartheid. Um, you started to talk about that in your, le your last response, but could you elaborate on that statement? Yes, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, what I call etiology or diagnosis in the medical field being settler colonialism. It is important that we agree to the diagnosis before we offer therapies or what we call prognosis, future, uh, what's going to happen. Now, the, uh, if we don't agree on the diagnosis, we have a problem. Uh, you know, if somebody is sick and, uh, and the doctor diagnoses correctly as cancer, they can offer the right therapy. But if the cancer has symptoms like anemia and headaches and so forth, and we just diagnose the symptoms and offer aspirin or uh, blood, uh, you know, enhancements, that's not going to cure the cancer. So it's really important to make the diagnosis. Once you make the correct diagnosis, which is settler colonialism, uh, based on the facts and the figures, as I mentioned, 8 million refugees out of 14 million, Palestinians living in Bantustans with uh, two sets of laws, one for Jews, one for non-Jews in this, uh, for the people who remain in this country. 
et cetera. Uh, then once you make the right diagnosis, you look at therapy. How do you design therapy and how do you decide on prognosis? Well, it's very simple. As in the medical field, we look at other situations, other patients, if you want, and see how they recovered or how they dealt with it. Now, colonialism has one of three possible outcomes. There is the outcome of Algeria, where uh, one million French packed their bags and went to France. I don't even say back to France because some of them were six, seven generations in Algeria. Some of them have never seen France in their lives. And uh, this ended colonization in Algeria, but it was very bloody at the cost of some 2 million Algerian lives and some 150,000 French lives. This is one possible scenario. Second possible scenario for colonialism is what happened in the United States and in Australia, which is a genocide of the native people, outright genocide, um, leaving so few of them that they are quote unquote manageable. Um, that's, that's also a scenario, but both scenario one and scenario two are very rare. The third and only other scenario possible is the most common scenario found in over 150 countries on earth, like Latin America, Central America, you know, uh, Caribbean islands, Cuba, Mexico, etc. Uh, North America, you find it in Canada and Mexico, you find it in uh, Southeast Asia, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Taiwan, etc. You find it in South Africa after the end of apartheid. That scenario is coexistence, basically descendants of the colonized and descendants of the colonizers living in one country. These are the only three possible scenarios. And based on probability alone, the outcome, patient outcome, Scenario three is the most likely scenario to happen in this case, in this particular patient called Palestine or Israel or whatever you want to call it. Um, there is no two-state quote-unquote solution per se. I never heard of colonial, anti-colonial situation that ended up in a real two-state. It may happen interim. For example, when the US signed agreements with the natives uh, to allow them to be independent nations in particular areas of the country. But that is in terms of things that never last. South Africa also tried to do it with what's called the Bantu stands, which means the countries for the Bantu people, uh, creating states within a state. That doesn't happen. It cannot last. It's just a temporary a bandage on a bleeding artery, basically. It doesn't help very much. So, <clears throat> so what we need to look for is coexistence based on human rights. And that's the third scenario, because none of us really want the first or second scenario here. Uh, I'm sure the Israelis don't want, uh, uh, Palestinians don't want the uh, first and second scenario, the Algerian scenario or the genocide scenario. I mean, there are always some individuals who want it. There are some Israeli leaders who are calling for the genocide of the Palestinians to end this problem, uh, so to speak. And, uh, but, but again, you know, and, and there may be a very radical uh, few Palestinians who are calling for the Algerian model, but the vast majority of people here don't want scenario one or scenario two. They want scenario three, which is a, a country for all its citizens. And that's what will happen and is happening as we speak, whether Zionism, colonialism wants it or not, uh, it is happening. Between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean, there are currently six and a half million Palestinians uh, uh, of various religions. And there are 6.1 million Israeli Jews. There's actually a majority who are not Jews. But even upon, uh, from the 6.1 million Israeli Jews, many are anti-Zionist or post-Zionist, post-colonialist, post-Zionist, basically. Well, 
the vision that you present is certainly rational. Uh, and I think that it's one that all liberal democratic people can support. The problem is that the two parties in question, despite your optimism about their acceptance of it, certainly aren't accepting it right now. The, um, the Israelis are uh, intransigent about having a Jewish state, uh, which means that Palestinians you know, can't claim the land of Canaan as, their, as partly theirs anymore, at least not in that area. And even the Palestinians, some, many of the Palestinians who are part of popular resistance, whom we met back in 2018, were still speaking in favor of a two-state solution. Um, I remember after we met you and we heard your impromptu lecture, we went back and talked about one state with human rights and you know multi-ethnic and all that, and they they resisted. And these were Palestinians, so maybe we could you know first focus on uniting Palestinians behind your vision. Yeah, let me talk about both uh, uh, areas. Uh, now I don't necessarily believe there are two sides to this conflict, so-called Palestinians and so-called Israelis. Uh, first of all, I mean, we're all human beings of various religious and political backgrounds. Among Palestinians, there are various political factions and ideas for the best forms of government. There are communists, there are Islamists, there are uh, you know, secularists, there are all sorts of ideas. The same on the Israeli side. There are uh, many, many ideas, and some ideas, I would say, uh, from some Israelis are analogous to some ideas from some Palestinians, and vice versa. Um, but let's talk specifically about this notion of two states. This notion of two states was originated not by the Palestinians, not a single Palestinian supported two state solution before 1993. I challenge you to find me one Palestinian voice that supported uh, really a two state solution before 1993. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of a two state actually came from Ben Gurion in 1920s. And Ben Gurion became the first Israeli prime minister after 1948. But his idea of a two state was not a real two state, it was a, a, a virtual two state where we just talk about two states endlessly without actually implementing them. Uh, because he was asked about that in private meetings with the Mapam or in his letters to his son or in his diaries, he explained that we need to be talking about two states and we need to show that we really want two states but not implement it because it shows that we want peace and so on and we are willing to split the land with the native people who lived in this land before we came from Europe to colonize it. This is his view in the 1920s that it's a good public relations campaign and many Israeli leaders, right-wing, left-wing Zionists, they all uh, claim that they want a two-state solution. Well, if they want, they want it, they have the, the power to implement it. They've always had the power to implement it from 1948 till today. And so they are not implementing. So on the Israeli side, the so-called support for two-state solution is not really genuine. And I challenge you to find Israeli leaders who accept two sovereign states, not state in uh, like an apartheid uh, system uh, where there's no control over natural resources or air or water or anything else. Uh, you know, that's not a state, that's, that's a Bantustan. Uh, if you find such leaders, I would like to see them. I don't see them, I don't see their statements in support of sovereignty or recognition of the rights of Palestinians to their own land. Um, among the Palestinians after 1993, uh, I must admit there were some 
delusional Palestinians who do not read history, who just look at the strength and power and that the US supports Israel and there's no way to win uh, by struggling for our independence, for our freedom. So we might as well accept whatever the international, so-called international community represented by the US, which dominates world affairs, wants us to do. And the US told them, uh, people like Abu Mazen and Yasser Arafat before him, that uh, if you accept a two-state solution, we give you economic aid and uh, you know transition period of five years, and you will get your state. And this started 1993. The five years have passed, obviously. Uh, we're now in the 29th year, and no Palestinian state was formulated. So obviously, this was all lies and not real. Uh, but still, there are Palestinians who still hold on to the straws that somehow the US will, uh, will somehow convince Israel to give the Palestinians some form of a state, but it's not a state with sovereignty. Uh, as every American president have said, Palestinians cannot have a sovereign state like any other country. Uh, they would have to uh, just contend themselves with having a state without arms, demilitarized, without control of its borders, without Jerusalem, without the refugees returning to their homes and lands, uh, without basic human rights, basically. Okay, well, um, let's go on. You uh, kind of, in, I guess you have indicated that we can't look to the leadership, I suppose, either in Palestine and <clears throat> certainly not in Israel to help us move toward this, um, to move on this new roadmap for peace against apartheid and uh, settler colonialism. Um, so you say that the best, our best hope is in popular resistance. Could you talk about the three great uprisings um, that I can think of anyway that have occurred in the last, well, in recent times, uh, the two intifadas in the late 80s and the early 2000s, and then much more recently, the Great March of Return in Gaza. Um, how effective would you say they were? What did they accomplish? And um, have did Palestinians learn anything from these big uprisings? Good, thank you. Uh, now we're moving to the therapies, basically. Right, right. <laughs> and so, yes, um, I mean, if we all agree that settler colonialism, the best outcome for it is uh, democ democracy, human rights, equality, justice, uh, that means uh, obviously one country for all its people, uh, every religion is treated equally, not uh, chosen people, notions, not laws that discriminate against non-Jews, or for that matter, if I don't want a Muslim state or a Christian state a la crusaderism, I want a state of its citizens. If that's our outcome, which is most likely to happen, uh, then what's the therapy? The therapy starts with the body itself. The body itself, the historic Palestine, as I mentioned in the beginning, was multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious society, and has always rejected notions of uniformity. For example, the Crusaders lasted here 120 years, tried desperately to make the country Catholic, or at least supposedly Catholic, but they were not motivated by the Catholic dogma. They were most motivated by political and other reasons. Same as there was one Muslim leader and his son who tried to make it a Muslim country for 40 years, they failed. Uh, so, and then there's Zionism, which tried to make it a Jewish state and it failed past tense. Now, why do these movements fail? They fail because the local people resisted. Hence, resistance is important. The local people, regardless of their religion, my ancestors, by the way, uh, were Christian, but they fought with the Muslims against the Crusaders. 
Why? Because we were living together in one country, Jews, Christian, Muslim. We don't want this country to become a Christian Catholic state. Uh, so, so we resisted this notion. Uh, so the same, I mean, if you are talking about the white state or uh, in South Africa, white state and Jim Crow laws in the South, there are many whites who rejected that. This resistance comes from all quarters, from people of various religions of various backgrounds, because it's logical to resist settler colonialism. And so Palestinians engaged in resistance going back 130 years from the time of Herzl and his idea of Zionism and a Jewish state. And they resisted by uh, many, many methods. Uh, hundreds of methods, most of them nonviolent. Uh, most of the people engaged in nonviolent resistance. Few people engaged in armed resistance. Uh, and uh, of course, resistance is not uniform. It comes uh, as waves because people, uh, cyclical, uh, generational, older people get tired, the new generation comes up more energized whatever, but you always have cyclical situations. These are uprisings, or we call them in Arabic intifadas. Uh, so, you know, we had 14 uprisings. In South Africa, they have they had 15, by the way, uh, against apartheid in South Africa. So I'm optimistic that we will have one final uprising and then we'll be finished with it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, these, these waves, which are uprisings or intifada, uh, we've had several. In my lifetime, I think there were like six. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the last three, of course, are most memorable to me because I participated in them. So, and I know what's, you know, as, as an adult participating in these things and helping uh, people resist non-violently. Again, you know, not, not with arms or anything else. I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in the philosophy of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Desmond Tutu. Uh, you know, I knew Desmond Tutu. Actually, I spoke at his church um, in South Africa a few years ago. Uh, he recently died. Uh, so this is what we engage in. And these uprisings are very critical to always knock on the door of the oppressor uh, or knock on the wall until the wall tumbles, you know? Uh, slowly they chip at this wall of oppression. And I think that's what's happening here. And hopefully the next uprising will finish this. But we do need international support, of course, and we can talk about that in, uh, later. But, you know, inter like with South Africa, there was boycott divestment sanctions uh, around the world that helped uh, convince the white elites in South Africa that their route of exclusivism and dominance of whites in South Africa is not the right way. So, um, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that you think these uprisings are really um, helping us make progress along the new roadmap to peace. They're really chipping away at the wall of oppression. And I have to say, especially um, in terms of the media coverage of the last one, um, the, well, yeah, I guess the bombardment, the recent bombardment of Gaza, which just occurred um, in the last few months, I guess, back in March and April, um, I really was impressed that it seemed like the media was giving a more accurate coverage of what was going on. They didn't immediately characterize it as a war. And um, especially on social media, videos that were shared, um, it was really, I think it was really obvious to people around the world that this was a bombardment of, you know, it was an asymmetrical kind of exchange between the Israelis and the people in Gaza. And I think that just awakened more sympathy for the people in Gaza. And 
you know, the bully that Israel is, is more and more being exposed. I don't know if you have that same impression. Well, uh, I mean, the Zionist uh, leadership from its uh, early days, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, they realized the power of media and they uh, sent their emissaries and they uh, purchased media, et cetera, to try and uh, brainwash people to think that the victim is the oppressor. Uh, I mean, at the time the Europeans colonized North America, they used the same language, but they didn't have media. You know, for example, they used to say, we're just circling the wagons to protect ourselves against those savage Indians that are attacking us for no obvious reason. Maybe it's a language thing, uh, but they are vicious, violent people, scalping people, etc. This is the the image that they put in. First of all, of course, in their own mind to justify what they are doing to their own people, uh, and second to the rest of the world. But they didn't have media like we have now in the 17th and 18th and 19th and even early 19th century. Now, the media in the 20th century and 21st century, of course, was dominated. Um, and if you look at early footage, uh, 1950s, for example, it's dominated by the same imagery and even the same language used against Native Americans or against Blacks in South Africa, that they are violent, that they are terrorists, they are barbarians, they are killing us. We don't understand why, and we're just defending ourselves. And occasionally, you know, some civilians die, but that's, you know, not because we want to kill civilians. It's because of the nature of, uh, of the enemy being savage, basically. Uh, and the children of these savage women, anyway, will grow up to be savages. So even if we kill women and children, we might as well uh, get rid of this savagery. Uh, so they use that. Uh, imagery. Now, what happened in the last uh, 40 years, really, 30 years, is a proliferation of the internet, which cuts down on the monopoly of news by mainstream media that can be bought. Mainstream media can be bought. Uh, everybody knows that. I mean, all you have to do is watch Fox News, Rupert Murdoch, of course, a billionaire who uh, sets an agenda for, uh, for the media empire. And this media empire can say certain things and that that's becomes the reality for many, many people. Uh, but they cannot control a lot of the social media. They're trying now to remedy this gap in, uh, in misinformation, if you want, they, uh, because there's people who are posting facts on Facebook. So now, you know, they convinced Zuckerberg and others in Facebook to outlaw, for example, Palestinian content because supposedly it supports terrorism, you know? Uh, and this is, uh, this is a danger. I'm not sure if the trend is helpful in terms of media or not helpful. Uh, I think uh, the designers are uh, very shrewd and very smart and, and very, uh, working on all levels of media, whether it's social media, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, or mainstream media, which they can acquire and buy off right off hand. Uh, they've been doing a very good job for promoting the Zionist perspective on the media. Uh, our, uh, our strength lies in the facts. We have facts on our side. And so sometimes defending the facts, defending a truth is much easier than defending a falsehood. And so the images from Gaza that you allude to, it's very difficult to argue with them when you're dropping white phosphorus on a refugee camp or when you're using one ton bombs on a crowded city in Gaza, or when you are uh, uh, using machine guns from boats on children that are playing at the beach in a football uh, game in Gaza. Uh, these images are very hard to combat uh, by propaganda. 
So I think the truth still is lying on the side of, uh, of human rights and, and we can use that and we must, but we, we have a lot of work to do and I'm not quite comfortable in the trends that are going on in the media. I'm yeah. more comfortable in the public being aware due to events and, and even like what we are doing now, the public will be more aware and I'm giving talks like three or four times a week. And uh, just the day before yesterday at Boston Community College, for example, uh, I gave a talk, 88 people attended. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interest and there's a lot of person-to-person uh, -person communication, which is very important. And finally, the people who come here, like yourself, if you come here and see facts for yourself, and please, you know, I encourage your audience to come and see. And yes, speak to Israelis, speak to Palestinians, speak to settlers, even speak to right-wing people, uh, left-wing people, whatever, but speak to people. The facts will become so obvious to you that you don't need right. media to tell you. Well, I think you're absolutely right. The best way to combat the Zionist narrative which has been dominant is just exposure to the facts. Unfortunately, as we know with the you know, recent pandemic, a lot of people are resistant to the facts and, and these narratives can just take over. And I can attest when I was very young, I totally bought the Zionist narrative. I read the book of Exodus. I loved those songs that glorified Israel about people fighting for their freedom and all that. And it took me a long time. And, you know, I became an academic to really free myself of, of that myth. And so mm -hmm. I just, I wonder if we can work on advancing a new narrative <laughs> that's closer to the facts. Um, Cause I think those are helpful too. Um, in advancing a good project like this one? I think, first of all, as I said, you know, we have facts and truths on our side. That's undeniable for anybody who comes and looks at the situation. I mean, you can jump through hoops to explain that there are 14 million Palestinians in the world and uh, 8 million of them are refugees or displaced people and the rest live in Bantustan's ghettos, denied basic human rights, like freedom of movement, freedom of religion, freedom of anything, you know, even health, um, you know, the COVID-19, all of these things. Uh, it would be very hard to justify that. Um, if you look at the facts, it's very hard to challenge them with propaganda. I myself, you know, I challenge Zionists to public debates um, many of them who one day accept and they do the first public debate with me, they don't want to have another public debate because the bad facts are not with them. Uh, they prefer propaganda and they prefer to just label their Palestinians uh, terrorists, etc. I mean, this is what they do and, uh, and without that they don't have anything. And then when Bush comes to shove, when they fail all the arguments, they go back to uh, the issue of anti-Semitism. They say, oh, it's the only Jewish state in the world, and why do you want to challenge the only Jewish state in the world? And we suffered the Holocaust and all of this stuff. Even though the Zionists actually collaborated with Hitler in several occasions, had even a signed agreement with Hitler, uh, they claim the heritage of uh, Jews who suffered the Holocaust. Um, when they really shouldn't claim that heritage. And, uh, you know, you read books like Norman Finkelstein, whose parents are Holocaust survivors and who were denied basic rights because the Zionists basically stole their money and convinced the German government, instead of directly giving aid to victims of the Holocaust, to give the aid to the state of Israel. And then the state of Israel decides what to do with this money. And of course, the state of Israel is not interested in helping uh, Jews. They are more interested in helping themselves. Um, so, so they fall back. That's kind of their last uh, 
straw that they hang on to, which is the, uh, you know, Holocaust, suffering, anti-Semitism. We are the victims and Palestinians who challenge us are anti-Semites. Uh, I myself have been called an anti-Semite simply because I called for human rights. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> which is bizarre actually, because, you know, the word Semite comes from a German uh, uh, person who hated Jews, who was so ignorant that he thought Jews of Europe were Semites, but Semites refers to people who sp speak Semitic languages. I'm a Semite, actually, <laughs> whereas a Jew in Europe who doesn't speak uh, Semitic language is not a Semite. <laughs> right. Um, so maybe we can talk now about um, the role of internationals in um, helping the Palestinians doing this work and and maybe and then particularly um, the role of Americans because our government obviously is the chief funder of Israel. Yeah, I mean, Zionism would not have succeeded if it did not have um, the Western sponsorship. Uh, and it started with the French and the British supporting Zionism in the 19th century and early 20th century with the agreements like uh, Sykes-Picot agreement between the French and the British and the Belfort Declaration from the British and Jules Cambon Declaration from the French in 1917 to support the Zionist project and then supported not just by these declarations or agreements but uh, by actual money and support and funds and weapons and everything else that they needed to achieve the goal. And without the British boots on the ground, there would not be a state of Israel. I mean, uh, that British boots on the ground came in 1918 in Palestine, uh, almost a year after the Belfort Declaration. And so the British are actually the ones who were tasked by the joint British French committee with implementing the uh, Zionist project in Palestine. And then after the Second World War, when Britain's uh, global role uh, was diminished, uh, the US took over the responsibility of or adopted the Zionist project, if you want, in 1945. And hence, uh, you know, the US FDR um, support and uh, lobbying and cajoling countries in the UN uh, newly established United Nations in 1947 to basically push for establishment of a Jewish state uh, using pressures and other things, uh, threats basically, to force a couple of minor countries to recognize the state of Israel and the US itself recognized Israel uh, six minutes after Israel declared itself a state. Um, against, by the way, the wishes of um, the intelligence community and the career diplomats and everybody else rational, even the precursor of the CIA at the time wrote a lengthy report, secret report submitted to the president saying that this is going to harm American interests in the Middle East. But they decided to do it because, as he said, uh, Truman, actually, not FDR, Truman at the time, 1947, 48, um, he said, uh, look, gentlemen, uh, to his cabinet, this was a meeting of uh, gentlemen. Of course, there were no women uh, uh, cabinet ministers. <laughs> but anyways, uh, he said, gentlemen, you know, uh, this is Truman speaking to them privately. He says, I know you're all against this and that this is not a good idea for US interests long term and this intelligence services and everybody told me against it. But you guys are not running for elections uh, for president and I have to run for election and I don't have a large contingent of Arab Americans who are going to support me like I have from these other sites. So the reality of it, the US made the decision not based on its own national interests, 
and still today it's not based on US national interest, is based on lobbying by the Zionist lobbies in Washington that determine US foreign policy. Right, so we need to lobby, we as um, concerned citizens for the Palestinians really need to lobby, I guess, our own representatives and Congress people um, to work on defunding Israel to the tune, the way that we do to the tune of what, $3 billion a year. Um, what about other things Americans can do? Um, can we talk about the BDS movement? Has that been effective? You know, it has been attacked, uh, as you know, in this country and actual anti-BDS laws have been passed. I was just reading in 27 different states. Fortunately, courts have Rule, deemed those laws unconstitutional in a couple of cases. So there has been some pushback, but I, I take this as a sign that BDS is effective. What do you think? Uh, yes, uh, boycott divestment sanctions helped us in the case of South Africa to reverse the policies of apartheid in South Africa. And it, it is helping us reverse the policies of the state of Israel, or will help us in reversing the policy of the state of Israel. That's why Israel considers such uh, uh, nonviolent actions as BDS uh, to be an existential threat to them. And they are correct to consider it an existential threat to a system of racism and oppression. Um, so what do they do to combat it? Of course, they turn to what they actually coined the term law, lawfare, like warfare, lawfare, uh, to use legal uh, or semi-quasi-legal mechanisms to prohibit uh, people who speak for human rights and justice. Israel just outlawed seven human rights organizations here in Palestine. Uh, some of them like Defense of Children International, women's uh, activist group, prisoner support groups, etc. Basic human rights groups, members of the UN recognized internationally as human rights groups. Israel outlawed them. And Israel is pressuring other countries like Germany, the US, England to outlaw uh, any human rights activism for Palestine, be it with BDS, or any other uh, speaking for human rights of Palestinians, using the leverage that they have uh, strong lobbies in the government to, to affect such a change. But as you pointed out, there's also some pushback from people because it's unconstitutional to stop people from saying you know, things about racism in Palestine, uh, you know, Israeli racism. Uh, why is that uh, illegal to say something or even prevent post, posts on fo Facebook that called, called Israel an apartheid racist state? It's a fact. It's an apartheid racist state. It has 65 laws that discriminate against non-Jews. Why is that cannot be called out? Just simply because it's a Jewish state, we cannot call it out for what it is as a racist has racist laws and has practices racism. Uh, so I think there's some pushback along those lines and there'll be more pushback and more public is aware, made aware of this. Now what the American citizens need to understand, in my humble opinion, I'm a US citizen. Right. And uh, I pay taxes, even I noted after I leave the US 2008, I still pay tax. I have to pay taxes. <laughs> this, this never goes away. It's like taxes and debts are the two. Right. <laughs> so everybody pays taxes, okay? What is being done with your taxes? Israel is the largest recipient of US foreign aid. Israel gets more money, this very small country, gets more money per capita, and even as a country, actually gets more money total than, uh, than all of Sub-Saharan Africa, some 22 countries, and all of Latin America combined. Imagine, you know, one small country. Why? Why does it get all this aid, all this tax money aid? 
per capita, actually, Israel gets more money than some, uh, some states in the union, okay? <laughs> some poor states wow. in the union per wow. capita get less per capita back from their taxes to, for services and infrastructure and whatever in their country in the US than Israeli citizens get. Why is that? So, and, and not only that, Israel forced the US through its lobby to engage in endless wars in the Middle East that cost so far, there's estimates of between four and five trillion dollars. Trillion with a T is what these wars like on Iraq and Afghanistan and Yemen and Syria have cost the US taxpayers. Why are we engaged in these wars? not because they are for democracy or for human rights of those citizens of those countries. After all, our allies like Israel and Saudi Arabia, they violate human rights on a daily basis. We don't challenge them. We don't send weapons uh, to uh, fund uh, you know, the, the, the insurgents in those countries. So we fund insurgencies and violence and wars because the Israeli lobby tells us that this is good for Israel, that this is good to have Arabs fighting each other, Muslim fighting each other, or Muslims fighting Christians, or Druze, or Baha'i, or Sunni and Shia. This is why we do it as America, you know? And so it's, it's we have to, as Americans, we have to push for our own interests first. And, uh, and that would entail stopping this aid to Israel. Individual citizens, we have, uh, I think, a few minutes left. So I want to say individual citizens in the US can help us. We have institutions that work globally against climate change, against uh, oppression, against racism. If they want to contact us uh, here, I can send them a list of about 40, actually 70 actions I can do for human rights and justice, not just in Palestine, but around the world. Uh, they can email me at info at palestinenature.org. Palestinenature.org uh, is our uh, website for the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability, which is sustainability with human and natural communities. Okay, and I can get that information out when we <clears throat> distribute this video. Um, thank you for that. And then just one last thing before we have to close. Um, <clears throat> I really love your optimism. You're just very upbeat. You're matter of fact about casualties that your movement suffers. You just keep going. Um, and I just have to ask, this, you know, given that the situation in Palestine is dire, what what gives you hope? What is the source of your continuing hope? And and you even exude a kind of serenity when you look toward the future. What's the source of that for you? Yeah, I mean, hope and optimism relate to what we want done in this world. Why was Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi and all these people hopeful? They were hopeful because they know that in each of us, each human being, even my oppressor, even the Israeli soldier who sat on my chest and cracked my rib, that there is humanity in this in people, and that this humanity is not what we see manifest, which is oppression, war, climate change, pandemics, uh, destruction. There's so much goodness that's going around. There's so much, so many thousands and thousands of people here in Palestine that are doing good work, agriculture, intensive agriculture, uh, you know, working with children. I have children visit this Museum of Natural History. Uh, I see the brightness in their minds and their eyes and their creativity. This gives us hope for the future. We can not only envision a better future, but we can work towards that. If our future is, if we claim we are for democracy and for human rights, for women's rights, for children's rights, we should all work for that. It is not enough to be for something if you don't actually do something about it. Uh, read the letter from Martin Luther King from Birmingham jail. Uh, 
it's remarkable in explaining why we should have hope, even when he was in the jail, you know, and the FBI was after him and all that stuff. There is hope, there's hope in the world. We should just visualize it, work for it and achieve it. Each of us has that within our own hearts to do it. Thank you, Mazen, um, once again for your wisdom and, and once again, I'm inspired by your words and I'm so glad that this will go out to a, a great many people. Um, and just my parting word is, I hope to see you again, uh, maybe in the next year or so in Palestine. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Good morning.